Greetings, dear viewer, and welcome back. So far, we've seen that despite having had the same length of time as the rest of humanity to contribute anything to the pool of human knowledge, flatards still don't even have a working map of their fantasy world. Having established that for them the sun must be a magic flying spotlight, in the last part we saw how the seasons lead inexorably to the conclusion that the flying spotlight also has a shape-shifting lampshade. In this part, we're going to have to look at this flying spotlight idea some more. We know the angular velocity of the flying spotlight, as it must always complete one circuit of the flat Earth in a day. At the equinoxes, when overhead to the equator, 10,000 kilometers from the center of the space pizza, the flat Earth flying spotlight must travel at 2,618 kilometers per hour. As we saw earlier though, at the June solstice, the sun is over the Tropic of Cancer, which on the flat Earth is 2,604 kilometers closer to its center. Here then the sun covers a smaller distance in 24 hours, and so must move more slowly, a more sedate 1,936 kilometers per hour. At the December solstice, however, the flying spotlight is over the Tropic of Capricorn, 2,604 kilometers south of the equator, here the Sun obviously has to cover a larger distance in 24 hours, and must move more quickly. A decidedly racy 3,300 km per hour. A difference in speed of 1,364 km per hour between the solstices should be easy to detect. All flat odds need to do is see what happens to the position of the Sun at these two times of year. A flat odd on the Tropic of Capricorn at the December solstice should see the Sun's position change in one hour by a larger amount than a flat odd on the Tropic of Cancer at the June solstice. Given the difference in speed of the flat odd flying spotlight between these two times of year. And yet, this doesn't happen. In reality, everyone will see the Sun move through about 15 degrees, and the reason for this is simple. They're on a spheroid, and the angular rate at which objects appear to cross the sky is primarily determined by the rate of rotation of the Earth, with the relative motions of Earth and those objects contributing another minor component. This result, this simple observation that flat arts haven't managed to do yet, despite having the same length of time to figure this stuff out as the rest of us, leads us remorselessly to the conclusion that they are oxygen thieves, and that this delusion which they cling to so pathologically is bollocks. Flatards also have no explanation for why the magic flying spotlight changes its distance from the center of their disk world to give us the seasons in the first place. Hey! As the spotlight flies around above Flatardia, it is of course constantly changing direction. That is, it is subject to acceleration, and the simplest laws of motion tell us that that needs a force. A centripetal force. What provides this force to the magic flying spotlight? Could it be Mr. Spotlight Hammerman? Who knows? Flat odds certainly don't. Maybe the North Pole is actually a very big pole, with some magic string holding the spotlight like a giant game of swing ball. Maybe the space wizard who made the giant snow globe with the magic spotlight swing ball set included a mechanism to vary the length of the string so that the sun's distance from the center of Earth can change, giving us the seasons. The slight flaw with this idea is the lack of a pole at the North Pole. But maybe that's what they want us to believe. So they have stopped flat arts finding this giant swing ball set using a cunning network of guard polar bears and spy seals. Who knows? Flatards certainly can't tell us anything useful about their world. Whatever the solution to the magic flying spotlight conundrum, one slight problem is the simple concept of the conservation of angular momentum. We've seen that the flying spotlight must travel faster the further south it is. Unfortunately, to conserve angular momentum, the exact opposite would happen. This would mean that days would lengthen as the sun got further from the center of Flatardia and shorten as it moved closer. This doesn't happen, so it looks like we have another clear and unmitigated failure for the flying spotlight. <laughs> Given that flat arts have no workable explanation for what the sun is, how it moves, or why it moves, their flying spotlight's inability to conform to the known laws of physics is grounds enough for the rest of us to settle comfortably on the conclusion that we don't live on a giant Jaffa cake illuminated by a magic flying lamp, and that the very idea is obviously bollocks. 
Whatever the cause of the magic flying spotlight's motion, its apparent path across the sky and the shadows it casts also tells us about the shape of the Earth and the distance to the Sun. Recall that Flatards claim the Sun is a nice round 3,000 miles or 4,800 kilometers above Earth. If this were the case, and if the stars really were just fairy lights in a dome or on a rotating disk above Earth, then even the naked eye observer should notice some very simple effects. One man's sunrise is another man's noon and another man's sunset. This has to be true on the flat Earth too, as we saw in part two, even though it presents a paradox that flat odds have still made no effort to reconcile. On a flat Earth, this obviously means that the Sun is further away from the observer at sunrise and sunset than it is at solar noon. If we consider our equatorial observers from part two at the equinox, both Mr. Sunrise and Mr. Sunset are route two times 10,000 kilometers horizontally distant from the flying spotlight, and it's at 4,800 kilometers altitude above Mr. Noon. For Mr. Sunrise and Mr. Sunset at the equator on the equinoxes, the flying spotlight is 14,934 kilometers away, or 3.111 times further away than it is for Mr. Noon. The angular diameter of the sun is around 32 arc minutes, or 0.53 degrees. So for Mr. Noon, this means that the actual diameter of the flying spotlight is 4,800 tan 0.53, which is 44.4 kilometers. When it's 14,934 kilometers away from Mr. Sunrise and Mr. Sunset though, its angular size is simply going to be the inverse tangent of 44.4 over 14,934, which gives us an angle of 0.17 degrees. Thus, the flying spotlight would appear 3.13 times smaller in the sky for Messrs. Sunrise and Sunset than for Mr. Noon. In reality, though, they will observe the Sun to have the same angular diameter as Mr. Noon. It is at this point that flatards reach for more desperate <laughs> ad hoc garbage in an attempt to excuse away the incongruity between reality and their delusion. But let's continue. Looking back at our map of Flatardia, it should be obvious that noticing huge variation in the apparent size of the Sun isn't going to be confined to the example observers we've looked at here. The observer directly under the Sun is the shortest distance from it. Everyone else on Earth must factor in their horizontal distance from it too. This leads us to an inevitable conclusion. Everyone on Earth should be able to record the Sun as having a different angular size depending on the time of day and their location relative to the Sun. As is par for the course when dealing with flat hardation, reality doesn't behave this way, and the fact that the Sun appears the same size throughout the day can be readily observed by anyone with an appropriate solar filter or solar telescope. The only variation in apparent size of the Sun is by 0.02 degrees over the course of the year due to variations in Earth's distance from it through its orbit. This is nowhere near the scale of variation that the flat odd flying spotlight predicts. This reveals something about the Sun. Either it's a magic flying spotlight that, by additional magic, always appears the same size to all observers regardless of its distance from them, or that it isn't a magic flying spotlight, and that this is bollocks. Now let's consider Mr. Noon's day as he watches the flying spotlight traverse the sky. If he were to note its position at regular time intervals, he would notice something very simple. From sunrise to solar noon, he would not only notice the sun appearing larger through his solar filter as it gets closer to him, but the angular separation between its positions in the sky would increase. From noon to sunset, he would not only notice the sun appearing smaller through his solar filter as it got more distant, but that the angular separation between its positions in the sky would decrease again. This doesn't happen. What we see is that, as mentioned earlier, if you measure the Sun's position at regular intervals, the angular separation between them remains the same throughout the day. The reason for this is simple. Earth isn't flat, and the Sun isn't a flying spotlight. It's not just the Sun, though. As we saw in part two, for flat odds, the stars must be either decorative lights in a dome or decorative lights in a disk. Well, pick any non-circumpolar star for your latitude and repeat the observation again. If Earth were flat, 
Mr. Noon would observe the same thing. As the star rises, the angular separation between his regular observations would increase until the star is at its highest point in the sky, and then decrease again. There are, of course, many stars, so the same effect would occur if our elite flat-eyed astronomer were to pick any stars he liked and observe the angular separation between them over the course of any night. If you extend this simple principle of changing angular separations out across the entire sky, it means that the angular separation between all stars should vary over the course of the night. The constellations should stretch out and appear bigger as they get closer to being overhead, and then shrink in angular size as they recede again. However, the angular separation between any and all stars remains the same throughout the night. The extent of atmospheric distortion across the sky is limited to that which makes the stars twinkle or scintillate. It's a tiny effect, and for the naked eye observer there is no effect other than pretty twinkling. The constellations don't change in size as they traverse the sky. So, either the atmosphere has even more undocumented magic properties that Flatard still haven't got around to describing or modelling in any way, or, and I put it to you, dear viewer, that this is more likely, given that Flatards are incompetent, lazy and mindless, that the stars aren't fairy lights in a dome or disc, that the sun isn't a magic flying spotlight, and that the idea of Earth being flat consequently continues to be bollocks. In the next part, we're going to find out whether a magic flying spotlight with a shape-shifting lampshade can rise and set at all on a flat Earth, and we'll find out what the flat-hard perspective on the matter is. See you then.